what's a priority for the synagogue and what's really the subject matter tal of your book, of trying to figure out American Jewish identity vis-a-vis -vis Israel, how we can create a bridge, how we can be closer with a strong Israel, a strong um, American Jewry, and a strong relationship in between. Um, I want to congratulate you on a marvelous, marvelous book. I'm going to begin with a question for you. Mazal Tov, Tal's new book, God is in the Crowd, 21st Century Judaism. Why don't we begin by you sharing with us um, the story of how this book came to be, your own journey um, that is described in this book. Um, share with us how, how this book came to be. Sure. So, so this book really began as a, as a journal that I kept over about 20 years. Um, started keeping the, that journal at a moment of crisis when I first had to ask myself in, in, in a very fundamental way, why be Jewish? Um, my journey to Israel started at a prep school in New Hampshire uh, without not, not particularly Jewish uh, environment. And that, that's where I spent most of my, most of my youth. Uh, and it was through exposure to the picture of the boy in the Warsaw Ghetto with his hands up. I think it's a very iconic picture from the war. I think mo most of you will, will recognize it. And I remember looking at that picture and, and feeling like I was getting it wrong. Um, you know, it, it's framed in a way that it almost, you know, demands that you juxta juxtapose this sort of uh, innocence of the, he must be a six or seven year old boy with the brutality of the Nazi soldiers with, uh, you know, with, with their guns kind of pointed toward him. Uh, and that never got to me. I looked at the Nazis, and I didn't know much about Jewish history, but I knew enough to understand that the, 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 they're irrelevant. They are just that generation's manifestation of an age-old phenomenon. And there were Cossacks before them, and there was somebody before that. They, they just keep rotating. The only relevant people in that picture, if you can, if you can uh, picture it now, is the parents and the neighbors in the background. Um, and I'm looking at them and wondering what they were thinking. This is 1943 Warsaw, and it looks like that's the moment that their Judaism is dawning on them, the moment that they're realizing they're not Poles, uh, not Spaniards, not Englishmen, not Arabs. We're the Jews, and this is what happens to us. And how could you not have had a contingency plan? How could you have abandoned this child to this fate? And for all I know, I, 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 I'm, I'm assuming most of, that, most of the people in that photograph were dead. Uh, within weeks of it, uh, of it being taken. Uh, didn't take long to say, well, why are you identifying with the boy? Why aren't you identifying with the parents in the background? What, what's your contingency plan? What's your plan B? You're as American as they thought they were Polish. Why, wh wh why are you not guilty of the same uh, negligence? And that's where my Zionism was born. That ended up in a series of you know, decisions, errors, <laughs> with me uh, uh, serving in the Israeli Air Force, you know, becoming an Israeli citizen and, and, and enlisting. And it was only after years of, uh, of service that I stepped back and asked myself, okay, so something fundamentally has, has changed here. And we have to answer this question, why be Jewish? Because 90% of us are here in the United States and in Israel. Diaspora is no longer a, uh, a useful model for describing the architecture of Judaism in the world today. And these are two jurisdictions where arguably, I feel, uh, anti-Semitism is really a fringe phenomenon. It's not real. You can be truly American in the United States. And we're watching that happen as, uh, as we speak, as most Jews in this country are choosing not to be Jewish, not to raise Jewish children, and most of them will not have Jewish grandchildren. We have three generations left in this country where when my grandchildren, again, assuming trends are linear, the chances that my grandchildren will meet another Jew of the opposite sex in the same age are slim, almost, almost zero, except maybe in New York City. And Israel's facing its own, it, it, its own issue, but the, the, kind of the, the dilemma that we're facing now is if we don't have the anti-Semites to force Judaism on us, we need to choose to embrace it ourselves. The way we've tried to solve that in Israel is by having the government beat it into us, and that's not working, and, and maybe we'll talk later about how, how that manifests itself. And in this country, we don't, have, we don't even have the government, and we are voting with our feet. And this civilization, which has been around for almost 4,000 years, is dissolving in front of us. Now, we can decide that that's okay. I don't think it is. I think I'd like to continue. Uh, if we are going to continue, we need to reinvent ourselves. And that, that, that's, that's what this book is about. 
Okay. Um, thank you, Tal. I mean, no, thank you. It's, uh, let's, let's hope we have an upswing here, but, uh, <laughs> but that's certainly reason enough um, uh, to write a book and to be prompted to write the book. Uh, uh, Brett, welcome. Welcome to the community. Welcome back. We've had you uh, before. Um, how would you characterize, uh, we'll start with American Jewry, then we'll move to Israel. How would you characterize the crisis of American Jewry right now? Or is there a crisis of American Jewry right now? Um, well, first of all, let me begin by saying what a pleasure and honor it is to be here. And in particular, uh, I'd never met Tal, but uh, you have a wonderful book before you and uh, an extraordinarily, not just an extraordinarily thought-provoking one, uh, but a very well-written one. And uh, uh, it's something I say about very few other writers. Uh, and, um, and especially for a first-time writer who's not even a professional writer, all the more impressive. So I really urge you to read it because whether you agree with it or not, uh, it's going to spark uh, a great deal of, of thinking. Now, having said that, I don't agree with the analysis. Um, uh, I mean, I would agree with it in places like France, uh, Germany, uh, elsewhere in Europe, uh, Latin America, where I think there, Judaism really has a crisis, uh, in part a function of anti-Semitism uh, and uh, declining circumstances. But I think, uh, by and large, the Jewish people are thriving as we haven't in, in uh, more than 2,000 years. Uh, we're richer, uh, safer, more mobile, more connected. Uh, more aware of uh, different aspects of our uh, identity. Jewish children have uh, an extraordinary, extraordinary range of choices, and those choices aren't always in the direction of um, secularism. They're sometimes in the direction of greater religiosity. My oldest daughter uh, uh, keeps kosher. Uh, I don't. Um, so that uh, actually, my son does too, all of a sudden. Um, uh, <laughs> My children fast on Yom Kippur. I merely diet. Um, <laughs> and, and all of this would have been unimaginable uh, not, not, all that long, uh, not all that long ago. Look, Jews, by some function of DNA or character or culture, are conditioned to think of themselves in a state of perpetual crisis. And, and there, are good, you know, there, there, there are good reasons. Uh, uh, there are good reasons for that. But uh, we have to we have to take some stock of where we are and be grateful for, for what we have. I would say one other thing, which is that um, uh, trend and truth are two different uh, things. And we often talk about trend lines and think, you meant you used the word linear in your analysis, but I know of very few trend lines that are linear. When I was growing up, Japan was uh, going to take over the world because it was on a linear trend line to, to, to overtake US GDP by the time uh, the year 2000 rolled around. Didn't happen. Uh, all kinds of trends that were anticipated didn't happen. There was a demographic trend in which uh, Jews were gonna become an, uh, a minority uh, to the west of the, uh, of the Jordan River. H actually hasn't, uh, hasn't happened. Uh, why? Because Israel is defying demographic trends in the, in, in the developed world and, and even secular Jews have uh, a rather, you know, a higher, higher proportion of, of, of births. Uh, so all of these things need to be taken into account. That's not to say that we shouldn't take what Tal is saying very seriously or to say that his prescriptions aren't ones we should not adopt because the reason trend does not become truth is because you recognize the trend and do something to change it. And I think what's important about Tal's book is looking at that trend line and offering some really innovative uh, thinking about how we might go about shifting it. I mean, the, the, the beauty of the book is that it runs from your, your personal narrative, Tal, to uh, drawing on descriptive assessments of, of what's going on in American Jewry, and then, of course, the, the second half of the book, which is the prescriptive part. Um, so many of the, the personal reflections, the diary elements have stuck with me. Um, one of them, and I wanna to stick to American Jewry for here, is a, a scene where your brother came home from a winter break announcing he intended to marry a non-Jewish woman. And is he here? Yes. yes. Um, <laughs> wow, okay. So. Um, so, and you're describing the scene with your father um, talking about the importance of Jewish tradition 
and um, how it went from generation to generation. Um, and he responded, and one of you responded, are we only, are we not supposed to even date non-Jewish girls? What happens if we do, if it gets serious? What about conversion? Do we get partial credit if she converts? That's a different question, that's more complicated. But then the paragraph that I said, there it is. You write, it was Passover, and we were eating pizza as we debated the value of Jewish tradition. Um, the unintended irony was completely consistent with our upbringing and comically incongruent with my father's admonitions. Where was the line between observing a kosher Passover and marrying out of the tribe? We were Jewish, but were we not American as well? Could the identities not coexist? Would we lose either identity if we married the wrong person? Did we have to choose? And if we did, was it not clear that we would be American? And then you go on and, and describe. But that scene is sort of representative of so much of American Jewry that we worry, we strike vault, the sky is falling, we quote intermarriage numbers and otherwise, but, but you know, ask someone to light Shabbos candles? Well, I'm not from, I don't live in Borough Park, right? right? What are you talking about? And so, I mean, I mean can, you, can you give us more on that, Tal, about, I mean, the, the consistent inconsistencies of American Jewry? So I, I think one way to look at Judaism is as a, as a big collection of tensions, right? We're, we're, we're constantly, um, as Brett said, we've been looking over our shoulder for, for many generations, and, 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 and sometimes for good cause, sometimes maybe less. One of the tensions in Judaism is between the individual and the community, between the universal, for me the individual is, is, is represented by a, a, a universalist vision of the world, and particularism. When we say this is the best time it's been to be a Jew, I'm, I'm speaking as individuals. It's the best time to be Jewish individuals. I think that tension is encapsulated in, in kind of the, 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 the founding myth of Judaism. You forgive me if, if, if you don't feel it's a myth, but the Exodus. Right? To me, if you kind of look at the way we celebrate holidays and you look at what we, uh, the, the, the references that we, we seek to, to establish truths in Judaism, they tend to revolve around the Exodus, and it's almost, I often question what happened between Abraham and Moses. It seems like a very uninteresting uh, par part of our history. This is where we define ourselves. Come to shul the for the next month. It's, uh, <laughs> no. it's all we're reading about. It's all we're talking about. What is the Exodus? This is where we become a people. This is where we get the Torah. This is where the, the end of which we, 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 we arrive in the promised land. For the individual Jew, in this myth, 602,000 males departed from Egypt, went off into the desert following Moses, very quickly turned on Moses and said, it was much better in Egypt. You've brought us out to this miserable place, and who am I to disagree, they were there. Uh, and then they all died. Every one of them died. Two of them, almost everyone died. Two of them, two of the 602,000 actually set foot in the promised land at the end of that, at the end of that uh, passage. It was the children and the grandchildren of those who departed uh, uh, Egypt who, who made it into the promised land. Meaning the, the founding gift of Judaism can only be received as a community, not as a collection of individuals. In fact, quite the opposite, and that sets the tension quite, I think, dramatically for Judaism. It was terrible for the individuals, it was wonderful for the community. We're on the opposite side of that uh, today. When I look at intermarriage on an individual level, I, I, I love people, Jewish, not Jewish, it really doesn't, does not matter to me. And uh, by the way, subsequent marriages in our family were also to non-Jewish women, we're non-events already. We, 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 we learned how to accommodate that. Um, and I, I, I still feel the same way. But the numbers, and we can talk, I, I agree, Brett, linearity is a terrible assumption in any trend. But between linearity, you can go in two ways. You can go to cyclicality, which is where you're headed, which I hope, I hope that's where you go. You can also go to exponentiality. And I could make, I think, a pretty convincing argument that it's much worse than linear, what we're seeing right now in the United States. And I think on the most fundamental level, when I asked myself and took me 20 years of journaling to kind of come up with an answer, I don't know if it's a good answer, but you, you, you'll judge, why be Jewish? It's not an easy question. It's not an easy question. I understand why these people are leaving. I, I get it. And I, I don't want to uh, condemn anybody for making that decision. I think it's a fine, if you find love in life, I've I, I found that that's, that's a challenge, grab it. Don't, you, know, you don't have to look a gift horse in the mouth. Um, but as a people, if we cannot come up with value, with a definition of Judaism that provides value both to the individual and community, I, I, 
maybe we should end. Maybe this is not, not worth keeping. So, so one more question on American uh, Jew, Jewry. Uh, Brett, do you think that non-Orthodox American Jews have made an idol out of liberalism? Well, yes, of course. <laughs> Did you guys discuss this? Before? No, no. <laughs> he we... said I could ask him anything. <laughs> But it goes to Tal's point about universal values and our ability to hold on to the particular um, and whether or not, you know, in raising the banner of tikkun olam, of justice, of a whole series of, of, of values that we are doing this um, uh, to our own, uh, dis, you know, uh, um, at our own peril. Well, right. I mean, you know, why have the Torah when you can have um, the Democratic Party's uh, platform. I mean, you know, it, one and the same, right? And one of them is actionable and gets you invited to the White House. Um, uh, look, I think that's, that, that's a real issue, which is, and, you know, the, the Judaism that you're talking about that's at risk of vanishing, let's be clear, is secular Judaism, right? Now, I think it's an interesting question as to whether that Judaism deserves to survive. Not that the, I mean, I'm not talking about the people. I'm talking about, well, what is this thing beyond Seinfeld references, matzo ball soup, and, and, and a few other sort of cultural tokens of uh, a shtetl or of a society or really a civilization that you have, you have left behind? Making choices that maximize your own interests and those of your, uh, those of your family. So when people talk about the death of, you know, Judaism, they're not talking about the death of Borough Park. They're not, they're not, what, what's going on there ain't death. It's a hell of a lot of birth, right? <laughs> and, and those, many of us in this room said, well, that's, you know, that's the old Judaism. That's not, that's not us. Actually, no, that's, that's Judaism. Now, I suspect many of those children or the grandchildren will end up migrating as our grandparents did to where we are now as more, uh, secular, assimilated Jews, and you'll have the process uh, begin again. I think the real question is how, how do Jews, how, how, does, how do secular Jews kind of form a set of values that are distinctive, meaningful, and kind of uh, keep you within the fold? And that's a really, you know, that's a very difficult question. One of the answers to that, and it's, it's in some respects, maybe not a wholly satisfying answer, but I think it's an effective one, is our affinity uh, with Israel and our sense that this is a locus of identity and pride and political thinking that distinguishes us from, say, the cut and thrust of most, you know, kind of liberal, liberal Americans, uh, especially as the Democratic Party uh, adopts views on Israel, which are, I think, uh, not my own, uh, to say the least. Um, so that's really, I mean, that, let's be more specific about the challenge. It's not, will Jews survive? Jews will do just fine. It's whether those of you in this, in this hall, your grandchildren are gonna wanna return to, to this place. That's, I think, the interesting question to ask. All right, um, thank you. Let's uh, keep the conversation going and, and turn to Israel uh, next, which is, um, Tal, your, your book, lays out a crisis happening in Israel. Uh, and you speak of the, the secularists, um, the theocrats, and territorialists, and a, a perfect storm basically going on right now. Can you, can you describe what the, what the crisis is as you see it in Israel? Sure. Um, right, so I, I do see Israel as, as a national asset for the Jewish people. Um, I'm not sure all Israelis see it that way. And I think at, at the heart of, of the crisis in Israel is exactly the same question that we're failing to answer in the United States, is what, what is Judaism? Uh, you know, can we define ourselves here? One, one of the, I think, important facets of, of what Judaism is, is okay, how do we govern ourselves? And we've, we've created sovereignty um, in Israel, which is, is a blessing, I think, and, it, and, and, and it's been a, a very exciting experiment and still energizes me every time I touch down at, at Ben Gurion Airport, I have the same jolt of energy that I had 30 years ago um, uh, when I went. I, I love that experiment, and it's beautiful. However, 
there are three competing visions for what Jewish statehood is in, in Israel. And I think we can segment Israeli society by the vision that they subscribe to. What, as, as you listed, the secularist vision of Israel is, and I say secularist and not secular because many people who subscribe to this vision are observant uh, Jews. Uh, but that vision is democracy for Jewish people. That's what we're doing here. We have very, very few aspirations beyond that. That, that, that. That's all we want. Maybe a bit of a Jewish character. We'll have the Jewish holidays as our national holidays, but nothing else. We're not gonna, we certainly don't want the government uh, uh, prescribing Jewishness in any way to, uh, to the citizenry. We have a small group that I call the territorialists uh, that hold the value of land, the territory of Israel, above the value of democracy in Israel. And, uh, and many of them, and, and by the way, these are some of my favorite people, uh, the, the best people I served with. Um, but their vision of Israel is, 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 is antithetical. It just cannot coexist, especially with the current challenges and the, the demographics uh, that we're talking about in, in Judea and Samaria. And then a, a, a third vision, which is theocratic. Um, I call them the theocrats. This is a, a group of people who want to be governed halachically. Uh, and you know, I, I think in 1947, when we kind of codified and separated these visions into different camps that live in different geographic places and go to a different school system, we, we teach them different, we're not part of the same society. Uh, instead of engaging in what, what I describe as the diaspora exercise of reconciliation of divergent ideas of what Ju Judaism is, we took sovereignty and, and, and split it up. Um, I think what's happening, and I, I, I write about a fourth Israel which, which doesn't subscribe to any of those visions, which is maybe the victim of, 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 of what I see happening if we can't come to this definition. Here's, I think, the challenge in Israel, without, without grading any of those visions as better or worse the, the, than the others, is in order to survive in the Middle East, we have to be strong militarily, and I don't see that changing any time in the next generation or two. Again, I... I, I, I I'm reluctant to predict, and I'd love to be optimistic, but I, I don't see strong reason to assume that that's going to change. We need to be strong economically in order to fund our military strength in Israel. There's about 20% of the Israeli population that is accretive on a tax basis to the Israeli economy, meaning they pay in. I'm talking about dollars or shekels. They pay in more than they take out, and there's about 80% that takes out more than they put in. Very similar to the United States and pretty much every capitalist democracy. We didn't invent that in Israel. What we did invent in Israel is that entire 20% is the secularists. Their vision is being defeated by Israeli democracy. They're growing at a slower rate than the rest. This is the group that pays the bills. It's also the group that sends their kids to fight the wars. The territorialists send their kids to fight, and I think they're the best people we have but they cost us a lot. They cost us much more than they contribute. <coughs> the theocrats in Israel as a group contribute to neither. What we're seeing gradually happen, and I've challenged a number of demographers to try to work with me on this, but it's not a politically correct survey to do, and I understand why they don't want to touch it, is let's segment Israeli society by utility to Israel's survival, meaning Chaim is worth more than Yossi to Israel's uh, survival. And let's see what Chaim does. And I can say anecdotally, maybe even more than anecdotally, but I'm not a demographer and I haven't done the survey, that these people are increasingly finding their ambitions met in Menlo Park and Palo Alto and San Francisco and New York City. We don't, and I say we, and I'm right about myself in this context as well and, and, and my family, we don't leave in protest. We leave to get a degree or we leave to take a job at, at Facebook, or th that's what we're going for, and it's temporary. But I, I see a lot of faces in this room that I, th that, that, that I know, and we're part of a community that has become permanent here. We're not sending our kids back. And a number of us, I'm not gonna ask anybody to raise their hand, a number of us have kids who are past military age and did not go back to Israel. We are losing that shrinking segment of society that allows us to survive in the Middle East. And the reason is that we haven't reconciled our, our visions. We're understanding that the trade is much better from here. I'd much rather write checks to APAC than send my kids to serve at a checkpoint. It's a much better trade. And we're realizing more and more, secularist Israel is realizing more and more, what, 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 why is that not the better trade for me as well? And they're taking it. That's something we need to address. I think it's quite urgent. Uh, again, something that I, I don't think is, is, is discussed enough in Israel, but, but I think you can see the trends. Look around this room. Thank you.
Um, Brett, uh, you spent several years in Israel with the Jerusalem Post. Uh, do you agree with uh, the crisis as described by, by Tal? Or do you see it otherwise? Look, first of all, I think we, are, we should be very careful about assigning uh, utility percentages to, uh, uh, to any group of people. You end up sounding like Mitt Romney, and look how he turned out. Uh, uh, t you know, with the takers and makers uh, 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 categories. Y you never know quite how things play out, and you never know quite how people who seem at some stage in their life quite useless end up playing outsized roles in their communities or in, in the economies. I'm sorry, but I tend to think of people in Silicon Valley as insufferable, and if that percentage of Israelis who go to Silicon Valley, I, I'm like, please be our guest, go, leave. Uh, uh, just because I, I don't think that the best of Israel is represented by some guy with some stupid startup that makes no money but is you know, overvalued uh, uh, by, the, by the market, uh, uh, you know, doing something in, in, in Menlo Park. I'd much rather have some religious kid standing at a checkpoint, making sure that the people and the women and children in that particular community are safe, more than some idiotic app that has notional value and makes life worse, you know, in aggregate. Um, so I think that's important to say. I think the second thing, you know, and you touched on this about cyclicality. I'm a great believer in cyclicality, and I'm gonna tell you, tell you a story that a few of you have already heard, but, so about 200 or so, more than 200 years ago, a fellow by the name of uh, Anton Volheim converted from uh, Judaism to, uh, uh, to Christianity. And then, uh, because he was a Jew from uh, northern Germany, uh, he ended up, through some weird twist of fate, ingratiating himself with a Portuguese aristocrat and then acquiring the honorific da Fonseca. Um, and the reason he did that is that the most influential Jews in, ha uh, in, in Hamburg were Sephardic Jews. And so having a Sephardic sounding name was, was terrific, even though he had already converted. So it was like the best of both worlds. Like I'm an ex-Sephardic Jew, right? Although he wasn't. Um, anyway, this Daph von Sekamon converts to Christianity. This is, I don't know, 1820 or so. Uh, a few generations later, his, uh, his grandchildren are staff officers with Kaiser Wilhelm. A generation after that, uh, his great-grandson ends up being murdered as a political prisoner in Buchenwald for the uh, crime, as defined by the Nazis, of Auslanderfreundlichkeit, which is excessive friendliness to foreigners, xenophilia. He was put to death for xenophilia, relevant in this day and age, too. His 11-year-old boy, this is 1944, I guess 10 years old at the time, because of the devastating loss of his father, grows up and becomes obsessed with his Jewish roots, is an avid Jewish genealogist. That man's daughter also becomes obsessed with the family's Jewish roots, gets a PhD at Cambridge on a Jewish theme, meets an Israeli guy while she's at Cambridge, the Israeli guy is a secular Israeli, uh, you know, 100% secular. She moves to Israel to be with him, and she decides she's going to convert. So while she goes, she's, she's with uh, Shlomi Gestetner, uh, you know, taking conversion classes in Jerusalem. This Israeli guy says, you know, I should know well, the first thing about Judaism. He goes to yeshiva. He becomes ultra-Orthodox. Their relationship comes to a crashing halt, right? <laughs> And that woman, that young woman with a PhD from Cambridge is stuck in Israel, doesn't know what to do with herself. She says, you know, I've always been interested in journalism. I think I'll get a job in journalism. She gets an internship at the Jerusalem Post. There's a young new editor at the Jerusalem Post <laughs> who spots this tall, blue-eyed, blonde goddess, is instantly besotted, right? And they end up getting married. That's, we're talking about my wife and we're talking about me, <laughs> right? And now my children keep kosher, keep kosher, <laughs> and they're German citizens, by the way. They also have German nationality. So all this tells you, and by the way, the person who ended up converting my wife is a distant relative 
uh, whose name is Volheim from umpteen generations you know, before, but they were converted because my father-in-law uh, knew, the, knew the genealogy. All of which is to say that you know, the God works in mysterious ways. And, and you have to have a certain kind of faith that if we've been around for over 3,000 years, maybe there's a reason. And maybe there's a wisdom, shall we say, the wisdom of the crowd that knows things that none of us know individually. I would buy that. So, so you open the door. So let me take the bait. Um, your children aren't recognized as Jews by the state of Israel. Uh, they are, but that's, there's, that's a long story. Oh. <laughs> so in that moment, to move it to um, this vision of this relationship between American Jewry and Israel, or the very fact that, you know, where a conversion happens and who recognizes what, and to this question of the theocrats in Israel and a divide um, about who gets to define who is a Jew, what is or isn't Judaism. I think we are at a moment of, whether it's crisis or not crisis, of divide. Um, and Tal, maybe you could, because uh, that really gets to the heart and soul of what you write about, about, um, about the emergent vision in Israel of Judaism and um, this, you know, uh, this what's going on in American Judaism. Right. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I would call it crisis either. I, I call it inflection. This is a, t a point where we have to do something. And Brett, whether you're right or I'm right, I kind of equate it to, let's take it to the Middle East in the last couple of weeks. There's a missile in the air. It's got us. It's locked on us. We can see that. It's now, we can sit here debating whether it's going to hit us or not going to hit us. Either could happen. We, we, we don't know. Or we could take some sort of action to avoid uh, uh, being hit and continue with our, with our mission. To me, I'm not, and, and I don't try to make a, 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 a precise prediction in the book. I'm, I, I don't know, right? Could be cyclical, could be exponential, could even be linear, who knows? Uh, I, I think there's reason enough to take action now and I think it's, it's, it's kind of win-win action that, we, that, that we, we should be taking. I don't like the idea, and you know, I, I accept if others do, of a, a kind of a, a very cloistered, um, ultra-Orthodox constituency defining Judaism for, for, the, for the coming generations. By the way, I don't think it's in sync with Jewish history. I, I think what we're seeing today in, in many ways is an aberration. This is not, this is not a group that can legitimately lay claim to sort of the mantle of, uh, of traditional Judaism. In many ways, it looks very different from, from, from anything we've seen in the, last, in the last 1,800 years. We can come up with a vision that is beautiful, inspiring, that, we're gonna, that we'll want to opt into. And whether we're going extinct or not, I, I think that, that, that's a good thing. I think that, that, that's kind of where we probably agree. I think that's, um, that's the important point. Um, Brent, on the relationship between American Jewry and Israel, um, best of times, worst of times? Um, look, the relationship is basically a pretty healthy one. Right? I mean, uh, there's always, uh, the real concern is whether uh, younger, American Jews feel the same kind of connection that uh, my generation or, or older generations felt. I suspect in some ways it might be a stronger connection. When I was uh, 15, I, I, I spent a summer on a kibbutz, uh, kibbutz Hefsiba, uh, up in uh, uh, near Afula. Uh, but I mainly, I kind of did that because I had some relatives who lived on the kibbutz, and it wasn't easy, you know, as a 15-year-old uh, to go. Now, because of birthright, it's fantastic. And not only do you go, but you hook up. So it's like a twofer, you know? I mean, that's, and that's the explicit purpose. It's like, discover your Judaism, and she's hot, you know? Uh, uh, so it's, it, that, that's, that's something that's quite, I mean, I'm, I just want to take account of, of something that's, that's very positive. 
Now look, there are a number of tensions and one of them, of course, is the fact, it might be momentary, that Israel is moving to the right and young people tend to be on the left. And my, my, my dear friend and colleague, Barry Weiss and I have a piece coming out in the Times tomorrow, a joint byline, talking about what we think is the idiocy of Israel arresting and deporting political activists uh, at, at the border because you don't like their views. Because whatever you think of their politics, and I, I frankly, you know, I deeply dislike their politics, you have to ask yourself, what exactly is Israel advertising when it kicks out this or that activist? It seems to be advertising its own sense of of insecurity, and the cost of that is much greater than whatever you're saving by not having some schmendrick go to the, you know, the security wall and, and, and you know, make a, make a speech. Uh, so that, that's something that I think Israel owes it to American Jews, given how much American Jewry has done for Israel, to be attentive to some of those issues in a way that I don't think it has been. I think that, by the way, also goes for prayer spaces, uh, uh, for prayer spaces at the wall. The wall is not simply the state of Israel. The, the wall is the uh, uh, central location of, of the Jewish people that Israel is a custodian of, but I don't think it should think of it as the sole owner of it. And I don't think the, uh, you know, the Orthodox should think of themselves as the so, sole owner of it. So there are those tensions, but I'm, I'm a little bit wary of sort of Peter Bynartian crisis of Zionism uh, um, uh, theses, uh, simply because, you know, one of the things that happens, by the way, I said, you know, part of the problem is young people are left wing, Israel's right wing, but you know what happens to young people as they get older? They kind of steer towards the center and sometimes towards the right politically, you know, when like the mortgage <laughs> becomes a concept in their mind, right? and. Uh, and that's something that we've seen over time. Speaking of cycles, affiliation and affinity with Israel is, tends to uh, trace the life cycle. You know, when you're young, you're indifferent, or sometimes when you're very young, you're enthusiastic, then you're indifferent, then you're sometimes uh, almost hostile, and then things change, and you have kids, and you want to take them to Israel for their bar mitzvah, and then you look around and you say, what an amazing country, and everyone's attractive. Look at him, the <laughs> perfect specimen. So tall. We, we should hang out more often. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't this good looking at Exeter. <laughs> now tall, you describe these, these three options uh, that Israel has um, in your book. Um, you basically say there, there are three options here and, and this is trying to build off uh, Brett, but there's no obvious way to do that um, in terms of his comments about your looks. Um, the <laughs> Israel can either annex Judea and Samaria um, and grant the vote, annex and not grant the vote, or find itself uh, with a two-state solution. Um, and, and you say none of those three are seem possible right now, and, and, and you spend some time in your book describing that, which I think cuts into this question of what's happening, whether it's young or old American Jews who are staring at the possibility of an Israel emerging that is not um, a democratic state. Um, and I know, Brett, you not too long ago wrote a piece on the nation state uh, bill, I believe. Um, so so do, you, do you see that inability to arrive at um, a, a two-state solution as a crisis on its own right and vis-a-vis -vis American Jews' uh, relationship to Israel? Well, for, I, I think it actually is solvable. Um, I, and I agree with you that, that there is a tie-in here. I, I would start with just saying the you know, we like to think in, in, in clear categories, and that could be very useful, but can also be misleading sometimes. Sometimes we miscategorize. Israel is not just a country. Uh, we have a, a, a separate ambition. We are the nation state of the Jews. What does that mean? We started talking about the kind of the, the, the difficulties of, of defining that. I think the notion, at least to me, 
is that it is a, an asset of the Jewish people. So when we talk about American Jews' support for Israel, have, having kind of lived both of those roles or, 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 or kind of tried on both of those costumes, American Jew and Israeli Jew, uh, I'm not sure I can see it that way. And especially when you get, and again, whether it's making an app that we don't like or an app that we do like, the person who served with me, who flew into battle with me and was willing to trade his life for mine is now living in California. Whatever he's doing, he's not defending Israel. His kids are American. They're not going back to Israel. We, we can't sustain that forever, right? We can't sustain that forever. The gulf is not necessarily between American Jews and, and Israeli Jews. It's between different visions for what we're even doing here. What is Israel about? What I think is happening, and your question is really on, on Judea and Samaria, which I think is, is worth addressing, even though the book is not a political book, but it is, that, that, that is an, an issue that's forming a rift in that of the three options that you put forward, just to clarify, I, and I only see three options. There are only three things that we can do in Judea and Samaria. We can annex, and depending on which demographer you follow, either become a minority or become a very small majority, in which case, in Israeli coalition politics, we're finished. If we're 51% or 55% Jewish in Israel, we're finished. We can annex the land and not the people, which certain people in Israeli politics are, are advocating, maybe not in so many words, but that, 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 that's what they're advocating, in which case we actually do become, and that's the ter a term I've been bristling at for 20 years, apartheid state, but that, that is exactly what that will be if, 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 if we take that course, in which case there are very few people I know who are willing to lay down their life for that. And we need these people. We need these people. I mean, when you see it from the inside, it is striking how few people our survival is dependent on at this moment. And these people, by and large, are, you, if you're going to categorize, are in a category that is not going to die for that. And then the third option, which is just terrible, it's not suicide, is what I think we need to do, which is get out. Get out. And let's not sell ourselves a false bill of goods. This is not me advocating for kind of the, the left in Israeli politics because it's not Singapore. And Shimon Peres was, got it wrong, I think. L let's assume the worst. Let's assume Judea and Samaria tomorrow looks just like Gaza. Let's assume that there will be zero Jews, that we will be ethnically cleansed like we were from every single city. The Baghdadi Jewish community is a thousand years older than Islam itself. How many Jews are there in Baghdad? How many Jews are there in Damascus? How many? You cannot be a Jew in the Middle East today unless you are the sovereign. That's the rule in the Middle East. I, will, I, I, I can't see us fighting for a situation where we're going to give that up. We have to be, we have to be the sovereign. There will be no Jews at, in, in Hebron. I, I think it's a travesty. I think it's unjust. I, I agree. And I agree with the territorialists that this is not fair. But it's the only solution that's not suicide. And again, the rift that forms, I think the rift you're defining is, is, is only part of it. It's not across the Atlantic. It's within Israel itself. You know, there's a story. Um... Clark Clifford, uh, who was instrumental in Truman's recognition of Israel, then was Secretary of Defense under LBJ. After his stint at the Pentagon, he became a kind of a Washington super lawyer. And he was, he was one of those guys that wealthy people with Washington problems went to because he could open the right door, he could pull the right lever, and he knew everyone. Um, this is before BCCI, but anyway, that's another story. Uh, anyway, so this, there's a story about Clifford that some, some guy goes to him with one of those classic Washington problems. And the deal was, and this is like 1971 or something, if you wanted time with Clark Clifford, it was $10,000, which was actual money in, back then. So the guy ponies up 10,000 bucks, explains his problem to Clifford. Clifford sits there, mulls it over, and he says, do nothing. And the guy's like, nothing? He's like, just do nothing. So a few days later, in the mail comes a bill for $10,000. The man is enraged goes back to Clifford, storms into his office to remonstrate, you know, I paid 10,000 bucks, all you did was tell me to do nothing, and you know, this is an outrage. 
Clifford gives him a very direct look and says, do nothing. And a few days later, he gets a second bill <laughs> for another $10,000. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom in what Clifford proposed. You know, we, there's this constant feeling like, well, you've got to do something, right? Well, why? You know, there are all kinds of problems in our lives when you just like hold off until some ripening uh, occurs. And then you'll, you'll act, as another great Jew once said, Herb Stein, said, you know, when, when, when a situation can't continue, it won't. <laughs> so we have to wait until that moment. But right now, you're absolutely right. All the options are dreadful, and the best option is do nothing, because in theory, what we desperately need is a two-state solution. But we need a two-state solution where the second state, where the Palestinian state looks like Costa Rica and not Libya, right, or Yemen or Lebanon. Now that's gonna require some transformation in the culture of the Middle East and transformation in Palestinian culture. But we know historically this happens. I mean, it usually happens when you get totally annihilated in war, as, as it happened to Japan, or as it happened to, to, to Germany. But throughout the Middle East, if you actually spend time traveling there, it's not all, you know, Aleppo and Beirut. It's also Abu Dhabi and Dubai, and even in places in Saudi Arabia when they're not murdering journalists, um, <laughs> where there is this recognition in much of the Arab world that they have squandered 72 years of their history in this fruitless, maniacal attempt to foment hatred against the Jewish state, which simply turned back on them and left them backward and, 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 and broken. And that there has to be some kind of better model. And it should be possible to have Gaza become something to look more like Dubai than it looks like uh, uh, Benghazi. But that's gonna require work. That's gonna require people, leaders, whoever it is, probably not Jared Kushner, but people <laughs> other than Jared, right, going to the Palestinians and saying, we want your state. We want it to work, but help us. Help us by not simply insisting on a politics of nonstop hatred and incitement against your neighbors. Help us by not having a politics of kleptocracy and self-enrichment and repression. Help us by actually trying to build progressive, decent, tolerant institutions within your society that are focused on the betterment of your own people, not the destruction of the people who live next to you. And nobody says this. Nobody says this because they think, oh, it's the Palestinians. How could it ever be with them? Well, don't subject them to the soft bigotry of low expectations. It would be an amazing thing if all these leftists uh, around the world who are so you know, mindful of, of Israel's moral failings actually devoted some time to saying, you know, it's a shame that Mahmoud Abbas is now in the 14th year of his elected four-year term of office. We should do something about that. And the various European Nobel Prize winners who go in solidarity to Ramallah to protest the apartheid state that Israel is allegedly becoming should say to the Palestinians, you know, the world has expectations of you as well because the Catalans want a state and the Tibetans want a state and the Tamils want a state and the Kurds want a state and Texans want a state, but they don't get a state. So why should you have a state? Give us a reason. But nobody says this. So the answer is wait on events and try to change the nature of the conversation from a territorial conversation to a characterological conversation. What is the character of, a palace of the Palestinian state that we are trying so desperately to midwife into existence? Friends, we're going to open it up uh, for some questions. Uh, my question is for Mr. Stevens. Uh, I find it interesting. Uh, you got a big round of applause on a lot of your comments, but um, most of these people uh, in this room, I'm guessing, have never voted for a Republican. And I'm wondering, how do we wake up Americans to the rising threat uh, to Zionism and Israel from the progressive left? Look, for a long time, I have said that um, anti-Zionism is the modern face of anti-Semitism. I mean, anti-Semitism itself was just the 19th century concept of what Jew hatred had been before. It's a shape-shifting phenomenon in which 
Jews are hated for, uh, for religious reasons and then hated for racial reasons and now are hated for uh, national reasons and yet the hatred remains the same. And that, uh, depressingly, that phenomenon has, has been really quite powerfully felt on, on the left and, and by no one more, in a way, no one better encapsulates that kind of fanaticism uh, as, as the leader of uh, Her Majesty's um, disreputable opposition. Um, that being said, okay, I think it is very important that Jews understand that we have enemies both right and left. It is not simply a left-wing phenomenon that we are dealing with. When you have someone who is saying that the international bankers and the globalists are conspiring with the open borders crowd to destroy our prosperity and our sovereignty, that person may not be an anti-Semite, but every anti-Semite who hears him knows that he's just a step away from the conclusion they've already drawn, that the international bankers and the media conglomerates, right, and the globalists and the Davos crowd have another name and it's Jews. And we have to be very careful, very careful about thinking that people who think like that are our friends or allies. Even if they say, oh, they love Israel, I don't want them to love Israel because in their mind, Israel is the white state against the barbarian horde, okay? They should love Israel because it's a thriving liberal democracy in an imperfect society trying to, trying to do its best in a very difficult region and adhering to a set of values that we recognize as Americans as basically our own. That's why they should love Israel. So when I hear Steve Bannon go on about his you know, love for Israel, that's not music to my ears, and I don't think it should be music to the ears of people in this room either. We have enemies on two sides. The, the Corbinistas frighten me, okay? But so do the people on, on the right who are talking about Israel as some kind of ethno state that should be a model for what America should become. Jews are in, ought to belong to neither camp, and we should be outspoken in our denunciation of both. Tal, what kind of response have you had from the theocrats in Israel given your solution and your solution strips them of some existing power they currently have? In writing this book, I, I dug very deep to muster love for every single Jew, whether it was the territorialist who I think is committing national suicide on my behalf, but I love him, to the Columbia professor who's campaigning to throw me in jail for acting in her defense as far as I could see. I love them, I love them, I disagree with them, I love them. I didn't do that with ultra-orthodoxy, and I regret it. The reaction, it's, it's still new, so there, there, there are very few ultra-orthodox readers of, of the, the kind of the galley versions of the book. <laughs> the reaction of those who have read it has been incredibly generous and humbling to me, and one of them very, very gently pointed out that, that, that omission, uh, which, which if I could write it again, I would, I would, I would write it differently. Thank you. Um, friends, one of my regrets of this panel um, is that we haven't focused uh, sufficiently on your prescriptive recommendations. And I, I just want to um, thank you, Tal, because not only is it a sober um, analysis of, from a deeply personal perspective of your own spiritual journey, um, but what you see as the challenges and opportunities in Israel, but then you go on and in a really bold way, um, set out uh, some prescriptive steps um, for American Jewry, for Israel, for world Jewry. Um, it's not just a book, but I think you actually have a mission here um, well beyond that deserves a hearing and debate and discussion um, amongst our community and the community at large. It's a fabulous book, God is in the Crowd. Friends, please join me in thanking um, Tal and Brett. And I wish everyone a good evening. We 
would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.